good. And Shane is back. He, he was the second one on, and then we lost him again. So, this is why we open up early, give everybody a chance to get in and get settled. I still have a minute or two. I think the fun thing about these uh, unstated meetings is it, it is totally unscripted, and we just kind of wing it, and I just pick an appropriate time between when I open it and it starts recording and before the speaker starts. And I say, here's where I start the tape. <laughs> here's where I cut the paint, the edit, the tape to put it on YouTube. Um, I always do it sometime before I do my welcome, which I try and do around 10 o'clock. But sometimes, Lee, sometimes we have like a really good discussion, like only three or four of us are on, but we get into something really interesting. It's like, well, I think people want to hear that. So I start before that. Sometimes it's, it's pretty much what you're seeing here. <laughs> And like I, I think we can spare everybody all of this discussion and this adjusting and, and kicking right around my start. So, but there are no hard rules. I guess if I spent more time on it, I'd I'd get a better feel for uh, well uh, the policies. Uh, uh, and as I said, I, I I'm not sure that what I'm about to deliver is what would be considered the most Masonic talk. You know, I, I as I as I said in the blurb, it's it's in the spirit of the second degree at least within how I understand the second degree from the English system, right. which is when you're meant to apply yourself to the study of the liberal arts and sciences. Right. So there will be some maths and because the understanding of the symbols means understanding where they came from and what they really mean. <laughs> like what, what they, uh, I'll make more, not, more of this as I go along, but there's right. what they mean. And then there's what they mean. Right. Uh, and the transition from one to, I, I think the, the the example that I would give is in our degree ceremonies, you know, particularly when we present the working tools, at, at least in the English ritual, mm -hmm. there's that classic line in the middle when you say, you know, you, you've given this long explanation of what the tool was used for physically in a building sense. And then you spin on your heel and say, but as we are not all operative, but rather speculative or free right. of acceptance masons, we apply these tools to our malls. Right. So this talk's going to vaguely follow that structure. The first half okay. is going to be very much mathematical. And then the second half will be some ideas about how we apply that. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Uh, let me finish saying hello to people and people are still dribbling in. Uh, Shane. I see you came back. You managed to join us again. Good to have you with us. If you want Hello. To. Yes. Sorry about that. I was I joined initially on my phone, and now I've joined on my laptop. So. Oh, that's quite all right. Good to have you with us. Uh, and where are you? Where are you coming from, Shane? Uh, I'm a fellow craft at Spartan One Twenty Six in. Oh, okay. Ohio. In where? In Ohio. Ohio, yes, thank you. Yeah, we got to have the state because I don't recognize most cities, smaller the cities, especially. Nice as well. Yeah, well, I, oh, okay, if they don't name a country, you can assume the United States, right? <laughs> I think it's pretty much a given. I That's mean, a honestly, very American approach to things, isn't yeah. it? Well, I mean, <laughs> American. well, if you say, well, I suppose if you say Cornwall, not everybody would figure out that's the UK or Great Britain or the British Isles well, or whatever the official term is. Huh? What would you say? No. Uh, bro oh. Brother Koch, good to have you with us. Coke. Coke, right? Brother Coke? We talked about that before. <laughs> yes. Set me straight. Coke, like like the drink. Okay. In, like, the Coke brothers. Brothers. like the Coke brothers. Yes. Are you one of the Coke brothers? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. You obviously, I do not see a mansion in the background, so no, you're not one of the Coke brothers. Not one of them, <laughs> anyway. You may be a Coke brother. <laughs> you have a brother. But or a sister, I guess technically you would be. Whatever, where are you from? <laughs> also from Spartan. One twenty. Oh, okay. And, uh... Yes, you are the one who asked about Shane. Okay. Yes. Right. See, eventually it all comes back to me. You know. And, by the way, just to be clear, I have like three thousand friends on Facebook, so people message me all the time, and I have great discussions. And then I totally forget that person, and I see them in a Zoom, and we're like, oh yeah, we talked for like, you know. Two years ago, we had this lengthy discussion on Messenger, and then I go back and look. It's like, oh, yeah, you were that guy. We talked about that. I'm sorry if I don't reconnect, so please, you know, don't assume that I remember every conversation I've had with every single one of you. <laughs> kind, of like a, kind of like a teacher in a you know class, a university-style classroom with 
200 plus students. You, I don't get to know all of you. I don't know if I qualify to be the teacher in this discussion, but for the sake of this uh, this uh, analogy, I am. You know, there was the case of the student, Brian, I told you about this, where the kid was in, uh, was in college and uh, the final exam came up and there was well over 200, um, well over 200 um, students in the, uh, in the class. And uh, they had the um, final exam was two hours. And the teacher said, you know, the professor said, you have exactly two hours to compete this exam. If you do not turn it in, you will receive an F for the entire class. And so after an hour, a few students were done. And after an hour and a half, most of the students were done. And there was 15 minutes left. And this one kid is writing furiously in the back, working, working, working. Two o'clock, two hours are up. Professor says, everyone turn your papers in. And everyone turns them in except for this one kid sitting in the back, and 15 minutes go by. He finishes his, his test, and he comes strolling on down, and the teacher's sitting there, and he has a huge stack of papers on his desk that all the students have turned in. And uh, the, the professor says, I'm very sorry, son, um, but you, have, you had two hours to complete the exam, and you did not complete it, and you failed. The student draws himself and says, do you know who I am? And the teacher looks back at him and says, I have no earthly idea. He says, terrific and shoves it in the middle of the stack of papers. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. All right. <laughs> All right. I think I said hello to everybody. Uh, Brother Guzman, good to have you with us. Brother Ade, always good to have you back with us. Uh, Brother Ade, I, I quoted you in our, um, our discussion the other day. I had a chance to give a talk at... Uh, oh, Hi, Chris. Thank you. Good evening with us. Um, let me do the official thing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virginia Research Lodge's unstated meeting. We uh, This is held on behalf of uh, Virginia Research Lodge, number 1777 in Highland Springs, Virginia. I have posted in the uh, chat here the link to our Facebook group where we have Events such as this are promoted and other events that people like Brian and other brothers will post events that are coming up that you can attend that are Masonic related. Uh, we also post our weekly research paper that we're publishing for the world to consume. Then we have our lodge uh, website where we have the papers and then our YouTube channel where you can watch this. And if you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. We love that. Uh, but you can watch all of our previous ones on YouTube. And then finally, my email. If you're on Facebook, please use Facebook Messenger to communicate with me about various things. Um, that's how I keep track of speakers and events and stuff. But there's my email if you want to sign up. If you have something lengthy or you want to email me something, by all means, use that. Uh, Brother Thomas, good to have you with us. So you just signed in there. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Good. Where are you from, brother? I'm from Warsaw. I'm, I'm I'm the friend of our speaker. Oh, excellent! Uh, yeah, good to have you with us. And let's well, see, good to be here. Yes, I want to make sure I say hi to everybody. Oh, Brother Brunswick, good to have you with, join us as well. Um. Oh yeah, Brother Ade. I was saying. Um, some of you may remember from January of this year, we had our talk on observant lodges, or as my friends in the UK would say, you know, lodge. But anyway. <laughs> That was the general gist of the discussion is, you guys don't do that already? Um, but we talked about <laughs> observant lodges in America, and it was really great. I had a number of people on the panel, and um, I I had the opportunity of the night in Great Bridge Lodge, which is right in my neighborhood here, uh, to give a talk. I took that two-hour uh, Zoom meeting and coalesced and boiled down all of their answers into about a 20-minute talk. And it was a lot of fun. So I got to introduce to a bunch of Masons who are not familiar with the idea of observant Masonry. Um, I got a chance to express the ideas, the eight steps to excellence and all, and um, and talked about, you know, what observant Masonry is and gave examples from our various brothers. Brother Ade was here with us, was one of the people I quoted, talking about uh, um, uh, festive boards and how a table lodge is almost but not quite what a festive board would be, but it's the closest Americans have to relate to it as a table lodge. Um, and it's not quite the same thing at all. Uh, but anyway, that was well received. And I had a brother called me the next day and said, oh, my Lord, 
these three brothers sitting in front of me, you you set off the cackling hens, and they were all going out like, oh, oh my god, oh I can't, we we would never, oh oh oh. So I at least had all the brothers in the room talking about it, which is was the whole point of the discussion, not to um, not to convert, you know, not to make, not to change that lodge overnight into an observant lodge. Um, but at least to get a discussion going and introduce some people to the concept. So it went really well. And I really appreciate everybody here who participates in our unstated meetings, giving the opportunity to write a paper based on that and give it in a lodge. And I was able to give a perspective of what observant lodges are. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, I will say this at the end, and I'm sorry, Brother um, Neely isn't here to hear this. I had a, I talked about the chain of union and I quoted Neely Dolson right at the end talking about how his lodge does the chain of union at the end of every meeting, which is where you all gather in a circle, put your arms on each other and, you know, during the closing charge. Well, in Virginia, we have a closing charge and you all kind of gather loosely around. So I had the nerve to, and I told the master I was going to do this, to suggest, well, look, why don't we tonight, just for fun, we'll form the chain of union during the closing charge. And then you can go back and tell every one of your friends that you attended an observant lodge. So, and we went ahead and did that though. And it was kind of awkward. And I think next time I'll coordinate better with the master and make sure he's totally like, he'll turn around and wait, make sure everybody actually forms, give everybody a chance to form it. But you can see in the room, we had about 30, 40 people. We had enough people where I was, we started a chain and I'm on the end. I was like behind the master to the left. And then I saw across the room, other people were kind of forming the chain. So we had a loose, broken chain around the center. So everyone, for the most part, participated and made an effort. And people said, that was really kind of neat. We like that. So maybe, just maybe, I'm starting to trend in, in my area. So that was a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, I've been running my mouth too much. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, anybody have any announcements or anything they want to bring up before I turn it over to our speaker. If you want to say hello, if you haven't been here before, say what lodge you're from or anything, I'll give you a chance to speak up. Um, I have put the, the link in the chat to the Thursday group for anyone oh, yes. who wants to sort of come along and join in with it. Uh, the link I've given there is our Facebook page. From yep. there you get invited to the Thursday group. And after that, you then get invited into a, a private messenger group. Indeed. The uh, yep, and and if you want messages, join that message group. <laughs> I actually I had to turn off notifications for that group because my phone was going off yes. like every minute. I was like, no, I was like, I go in and look, I go in and look at it, but it's kind of like Twitter when I first joined it, it's just like scrolling, 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 scrolling. It's like non stop. There is a lot going on, I give you all that, but I just I couldn't deal with having a, 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 a little chirp every single time uh, someone posted. <laughs> I prefer to get that one actually have a message directed to me. Those I want to be notified about. But yeah, your chat was like streaming. It was great. I mean, I, I think it's wonderful that you have that. And it's a nonstop party over there. So this, if you're ever looking for something, if you want to chat directly with people, I definitely recommend Brian's um, Zoom chat. So, um, okay. I am going to go ahead and, oh, um, I do not have the... Um, whatchamacallit, I do not have the video from last week ready yet. Those of you who didn't attend last meeting, um, which of course would include our speaker, uh, Brother Lees did not manage to show up for our talk. So we did not have the Rosicrucian and May Freemasonry talk that I had promised last meeting, two meetings ago, two Saturdays ago. Uh, I ended up giving a talk on Brother A. Douglas Smith and I'm going to publish it on YouTube with the correct title um, but uh, that was the first time in two years that we did not have a speaker show up. So I had to ad lib and it wasn't really fun, but we may do. But that will be out shortly. Um, but I'm going to go ahead now and turn it over to Brother Eccleston, who will give his proper introductions, tell us who he is and all that. And he can get started on his talk. Um, thank you, Brother Christopher. Um um, greetings, brethren. Uh, some of you I know, some of you uh, I don't. Um, I'm not entirely sure I ended up speaking to you today either, <laughs> other than a very gracious invitation from uh, Worshipful Brother Chris. Just, just blame Brian. Um, to, 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 to give you a, a little bit of background uh, about myself, 
I'm an English Freemason of origin. I was initiated at Isaac Newton University Lodge, which is attached to the University of Cambridge, where I spent 10 years studying uh, mathematics, which is where this talk will go. In the meantime, I moved to Poland. I've lived here for eight years now, and I am the primus master, so the founding master of Enigma, the first English speaking lodge in Poland. Um, I am also the immediate past master of that lodge because even though Enigma has existed for a long time, uh, in Poland, we don't do the annual thing. Offices change when when they've been earned, not not on the kind of escalator that, that we use uh, in the UK. And some of that will become apparent um, as I talk, I think. Uh, secondly, I'm not so much of an esotericist. When Brother well, Chris asked me to speak, he said, talk about anything esoteric. I said, well, I'm not very esoteric, but I am quite romantic. So I do believe in the power of assigning value to things. And those symbols can then become meaningful. But whether or not it's esotericism in the same sense that, that we all um, would think, I, I'm not sure. The final caveat is that the, the lecture is going to be split into two halves. I've been asked to speak for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes. That was uh, what we seem to settle on. And uh, there'll be two parts to that. One will be mathematics. And the second half will be my reflections and how we make that Masonic once we've kind of accepted that we can assign meaning to things outside of their original meaning. So the 47th proposition of Euclid and the immediate past master. If you ask any schoolboy to name a famous mathematician, assuming they can think of one at all, they will probably opt for Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a man that was born on the Greek island of Samos around 570 BC. He was a philosopher, weren't they all? the Greeks that we know, but more importantly, a geometer. However, what little we know about his life comes from much later writers, and the historical accuracy of it all is rather questionable. But we generally agree that he moved to Croton, a Greek colony in what was now Italy in 570 BC. And it was here that he founded a philosophical religious cult, the Pythagoreans, who believed that the whole universe was fundamentally based on number in the same way that we believe today that it is based upon fields according to the standard model of particle physics. But all of that tends to fade into insignificance because what we remember is Pythagoras's theorem. Now, the Greeks, of course, did not express Pythagoras' theorem as an equation in the modern symbolic sense that we would do today. That came much, much later with the development of algebra. In ancient times, the theorem was expressed verbally and geometrically, so words and pictures, no symbols, no numbers. And it attained its most polished form and its first recorded proof in the writings of Euclid of Alexandria. So around 250 BC, Euclid became the first modern mathematician when he wrote his Elements. And this Elements is the most influential mathematical textbook ever, still taught in schools to this day, and second only to the Christian Bible in terms of copies printed. And if you split up sales of the Bible into all of its various versions and translations, then Euclid wins hands down. The, the, more people have read this book than any other book ever written in any language, in any place, at any time. Euclid turned geometry into logic by making his basic assumptions explicit and then invoking them to give systematic proofs for all of the things that he considered to be theorems. He built this conceptual tower 
the foundations were points, lines, circles, and squares. And the pinnacle was the existence of precisely five regular solids. Now, one of the jewels in this crown is what we now call Pythagoras' theorem, Proposition 47 of Book 1 of The Elements. The less famous but most important intellectually translation from the Greek into the English was done by Sir Thomas Heath, and it reads as this. In right-angled triangles, the square on the side subtending the right angle is equal to the squares on the sides containing the right angle. No mention of a hypotenuse. There's no sum. There's a funny word, subtend. But however, this is an equation. It says that two things are equal. And that's because for the purposes of what they considered higher mathematics, the Greeks worked with areas and lines, not with numbers. Number wasn't really a thing yet. Thus, Pythagoras and his followers would have understood that sentence in our language as this. The area of the square constructed using the longest side of a right angled triangle is the sum of the areas of the squares constructed using the other two sides. That longest side is the famous hypotenuse, because in Greek, of course, that means to stretch under, which it does if you draw the diagram in the appropriate original orientation. But within a mere 2,000 years, mere, Pythagoras' theorem has been recast as the algebraic equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared where C is the length of the hypotenuse, and A and B are the lengths of the other two sides. And this equation very often comes up as one of the most important qu equations in human history. Uh, Ian Stewart, professor of the public understanding of mathematics at Oxford University, placed it as one of the most 17 important equations that had ever been written down by any human anywhere. Why is that? Well, most directly, of course, it lets you calculate the length of one side of a right angle triangle, given that you know the other two. So, for instance, let's suppose that A is 3, B is 4. Then A squared is 9, B squared is 16, the sum C squared is 25, and so C is 5. This is the famous 3, 4, 5 triangle. And it's the simplest of what came to be known as Pythagorean triples, a set of three whole numbers that satisfy the equation. Another example might be 5, 12, 13. There are infinitely many such triples, and the Greeks knew how to construct them all. And they do still retain some interest in modern number theory. And even in the last couple of decades, some new features of this collection of numbers have been discovered. And we'll come back to that later again. But what I want to do now is show what is it that Euclid did? Why is this theorem true? OK, and if I can share my screen, what I'll try to do now, I hope this works. I'm going to try and share a screen. I wanted to say, Lee, I'm going to get a chance to practice this. There is a whiteboard embedded in Zoom. If you okay, but is, is the share screen working? Yeah, share screen is working. If you want to go with your okay, super. whiteboard, so that's I, perfectly I, fine. I can draw that. Yes. Okay. So let's prove Pythagoras, because this is very important to what I'm going to say later when we get to the romantic or esoteric parts, right? We start with a square, right? And I'm going to draw it roughly, and I'm going to draw it roughly on purpose, right? Because... It's the idea of the square that matters, right? And then we choose a point and we call this length A and we call this length B. Now, using a compass and, and, and protractors and things, we, we can move that point to here so that this length is also A and this length is also B and the same thing here and the same thing here, okay? Nothing so magical. And then we connect those points. 
and the diagram is awful and it should be awful right that is clearly not a square but that didn't matter within the formulation of euclid it's the idea that counts because we've dictated that this is a and this is a and this is a and this is a so all of the sides match up so what we have if we drew it more properly but that's not important would be a square within a square and the length of each side is a and the length of each other side is b and so now we ask ourselves we think about area Okay, so we say, can we make some relation? We'll call this, whatever it is by the symmetry, this length here must be C and it's the same as well. So we can say that the area of the whole square must be A plus B squared because it's A plus B on every side squared. But inside the square, we've got C squared, the area of the big square. And then if you remember from school, the area of a triangle is the length plus I've divided by two. So we have plus half AB. Now, when we multiply, uh, multiply all this out, you get A squared plus B squared plus a b and then they cancel okay so c squared ends up being equal to a squared plus b squared and that's the proof right and it's as simple as that but we make a big fuss out of it and i'm never really sure why right it except for what it went on to let us understand so let's come back right there is tantalizing evidence that Pythagoras's theorem was known long before Pythagoras. There is a Babylonian clay tablet in the British Museum that contains in cuneiform the following poem, and it's poetic when you read it, apparently. Four is the length and five is the diagonal. What is the breadth? Well, four times four is 16. Five times five is 25. Take 16 from 25 to obtain nine. What times what must I take to get nine? Well, three times three is nine. Therefore, three is the breadth. So we're already starting to see that before this thing became algebra and geometry and scurry, it was poetry. Even more remarkable, although a little more enigmatic, is that the tablet Plimpton 322, which is stored at Columbia University, lists four columns of 15 rows. And it seems that the final column is just the row number. But the rest of the table seems to be a record of these Pythagorean triples. At least that's the case if four of the numbers are corrected. It, it, it's not absolutely perfect, which is what makes it enigmatic. But no one knows what this tablet was for. Was it a scribe practicing? Was it a mathematician calculating and making mistakes? Was it a student doing his homework and getting it wrong? We'll never know. But there they are, literally set in stone, almost the Pythagorean triples. These numbers have been relevant and important to people for over 5,000 years by this point. We should probably pass by ancient Egypt because there is some evidence that Pythagoras may have visited there as a young man. And maybe that's where he learned this theorem. However, and I'm sorry to ruin this for people, the surviving records of Egyptian mathematics offer scant support for this. It's generally said within the context of building the pyramids that Egyptians laid out their right angles using a three, four, five triangle. Typically, by tying 12 equally spaced knots into a rope at regular intervals and then forming the three, four, five triangle and thence the right angle. 
But that would not have worked, would it? Have you ever tried to take a piece of string and mark a place where you want a knot to happen and tie it so that the knot ends up exactly where you intended? And even if you could, where is the centre of the knot when you've made it with an actual string that has actual volume? What happens when the rope gets wet and it stretches a bit? The precision with which the pyramids at Giza were built far surpasses the accuracy that could have been achieved by this method. But far more accurate tools like squares have been found within the archaeological remains. And that is tantalizing. The Egyptians didn't, did know of the theorem in a way, but they didn't use it to tie knots in strings, even though that's easy for us to understand. They used it to build squares. And we will definitely come back to that later. Now, if Pythagoras was brought into today's world, he would have noticed many differences, of course. In his day, medical knowledge was rudimentary. Lighting came from candles and burning torches. And the fastest form of communication was a man on a horse, or maybe just a line of lighted beacons across hilltops. His known world was basically Europe and Northern Africa. Many cultures still considered the world to be flat. Who first realized that the world was round? According to Diogenes Laertius, it was Pythagoras. In his book, Lives and Opinions of Eminent Philosophers, he wrote, Pythagoras was the first who called the earth round, though Theophrastus attributes this to Parmenides and Zeno to Hesiod. So we have to take this into account whenever we do anything esoteric and historical, because history was not the same for them as us. The ancient Greeks, and to some extent us today, attributed that major discoveries had been made by their famous ancestors, irrespective of historical fact. They believed in schools, not individuals. So we can't take any statement at face value. But it's of no dispute, however, by the 5th century BC, all reputable Greek philosophers considered the world to be round. Even for the Greeks, though, the Earth was the centre of the universe and everything revolved around it. Navigation, therefore, was carried out by dead reckoning, looking at the stars, following the coastline. And it was Pythagoras' theorem that changed all that. It set humanity on the path to today's understanding of the geography of our planet and its place in the solar system. It was a vital first step towards the geometrical techniques required for map making, navigation and surveying. It's also, as I've already hinted, provided a key step towards the vitally important connection between geometry and algebra. This line of development would lead from ancient times through to general relativity, modern cosmology, how the internet works and how I'm talking to you right now. Because Pythagoras' theorem, what we now call the 47th proposition of Euclid, opened up entirely new directions for human exploration, both physically and intellectually. It revealed the shape of our world and our place within it. Now, for the sake of brevity to get to the end of the maths, I'll skip over the subsequent development of trigonometry. All that stuff about sine and cosine. But they will rejoin the story a little bit later. Because armed with trigonometric equations and suitable measuring apparatus, Mankind could now carry out surveys and construct accurate maps. Thales, in about 600 BC, used triangles to estimate the height of the pyramids. Hero did something similar in 50 AD. And then around 240, Erastathenes calculated the size of the round Earth by observing the angle a shadow made 
in two different places at noon. Now we skip forward 500 years, surveying takes off in its modern understanding. A Dutch map maker called Gemma Frisius explains how to use trigonometry to produce accurate maps in his book, Libellus Dilocorum Describerorum Ratione. This method then spread through Europe. Tycho Brahe took it up. He made accurate maps of Haven, the island where he was located. The Dutch mathematician Willebrod Snellius developed another method into its popular form that we now know, triangulation. When we make plans, when we make records of the way things is, the way things are, we use a method known as triangulation based on trigonometry and Pythagoras. And this is where I'd like to switch now into why this is so important for us as Freemasons. Because we like to build. And if we're going to build, we have to have a plan. And there's a great deal I think we can learn symbolically about Pythagoras' theorem. Because it teaches us that unlike we're often taught in the first degree, in the second degree, the actual working tools are not the end of the story. We could lose the square. And this is, this is the big take home. We could lose the square. But somebody in the room has in their mind the ability to reconstruct it. In a very abstract sense, if all of the squares went missing, if all of the physical objects went away, in our mind, we still carry the knowledge of how to reconstruct them by knowing that the length on the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. And that is and can only be a right angle. It is a square. So I think the reason why in English Freemasonry, particularly, we've assigned the square uh, with, with Pythagoras appended. I don't know if all of you know this, if you're coming from abroad, but when you are the immediate past master, you were a square with a diagram of Pythagoras's theorem appended underneath. And I think that is to remind you that after your five years of becoming a master mason, and your seven years of rowing through the offices and all of the jewels and all of the medals and all of the aprons that you've acquired, you then leave the chair and you become the immediate past master. And your job is to let go. You must let go of the physical things, the collars and the jewels and the aprons and the levels and all of it Eventually, it was your training ground, because now the ideas are in your mind. And if necessary, you ought to be ready to stand up and rebuild that, that knowledge. And it, it's, for me, the, 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 the 47th proposition and its association with the past master is very much about transmitting what we've learned in practice into holding it in our minds so that we can let go of things that don't matter. In, in my own personal reflection, I know how hard it was from becoming a primus master, somebody that founded a lodge and having set it up in a certain way and hoping it to develop in a certain way, but then having to just step back and let the new worshipful master take control. And he makes his decisions and I don't always agree. I don't always agree. But are we doing the same thing? Well, in my mind, we can be because we can square, we can form that square. Yeah, by knowing that we carry the information of how to build the squares in our minds, we, we, we don't need all the paraphernalia. And, and the titles, it, it just becomes about knowing that you know how to do it. 
And I think that's what masonry teaches us at every level. And it's something that we miss. You know, I, I said that this talk would be given in the spirit of the second degree. And I think the second degree is something that we overlook too often. Because the second degree teaches us how to live. Knowing what we know and using what we know. The first degree is about joining and being born. And the third degree is about dying and how to die. But the second degree is where the life is. And life is about getting out there and learning as much as you can, as about, about as much as you can, and carrying it around with you in your mind so that whenever it is required of you, you can deploy it. And that's why I find the 47th proposition so important, because it has turned up everywhere. Everybody is taught it at school, but everybody forgets it. And that's sad. But then it shows up again on a past master's duel. And it's supposed to prove that you've been through the work. You've occupied every office there is to occupy. Somehow the knowledge is there in your mind. And if the knowledge were lost, you are one of the people charged with reconstructing it from abstract back to reality. As students, we learn the reality and we abstract that information so that we can remember it. And then our job as leaders is to take that abstract knowledge and reapply it, should it be necessary, because we've also learned to let go. As the immediate past master, it is not your lodge anymore. So you've taught your students well, you've given them the knowledge, and then you let go. And that is the most important lesson, I think, that Pythagoras teaches us. That whilst throughout the rest of our degrees we talk about the square being the true emblem, it's not really the square that matters. It's the knowledge of what makes a square and the ability to either force it or not when it is required or not, that really marks a true Mason. I think that's got me to my 20 minutes, so I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lee. And there was no firm... You, I think you're the first speaker who keeps harping on the time limit. There is no firm time <laughs> limit here. <laughs> you're welcome to talk as, as long as it's interesting, but... I really did enjoy that. We have any questions from the group here? Any comments? I uh, fucking ask. Go for it. Sorry about that. Chris? Go ahead, Graham. Okay. Um, in the this is um, in the past masters when we invest the past master with his collar and jewel of office in Australia and I suspect in the UK as well, I'm not too sure about the United States, we do a short version. We invest you with the collar and jewel of your office and that's it. Or we use the extended part which includes your jewel is the 47th proposition of the Book of Euclid, da, 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 whereby our brother, ancient brother, Pythagoras, yelled or exclaimed, Eureka. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I always thought that there was somebody else that yelled or, or exclaimed, Eureka. Yes. And if that was the case, was our ritual written incorrectly or was did at some stage both of them lay claim to the fact that they exclaimed the word you wait I, i'm sorry you're saying that you think you think it was someone else that said eureka would we well, say well yes it was, it, it was, was I, okay i think i understand the question i, okay, I, I can please. give an answer to that okay and and, and yes in, in masonry we tell a lot of furry tales, right? 
No, and as I said at the beginning, they're called I'm, allegories. I'm, they're called allegories. Yes, allegories. <laughs> and as I said, I'm not particularly esoteric, but I am quite romantic. I don't mind that these fairy tales are told because they can still be helpful. No, yes, the actual Eureka phrase um, that would be uh, Archimedes when the water, when the right. But actually, it's like a modern day person just screaming out. I did it! Like, Eureka, uh, and it would be Eureka with an H in Greek, actually, not you. Like, Eureka, it's where we get the word heuristics from in, in, in English. It just means, I found it. Now, whether or not everybody at the moment of great discovery shouts out, I found it in their own language. I mean, who knows? Who knows whether Euclid, but I, I doubt it. I think that was probably, yes, one of our very learned, but slightly drunkardly ancient brethren ancestors probably just remember, misremembered the Greek that was supposed to be used in that context. And then we've all just memorized it for hundreds of years. But, but yes, it's probably wrong. It's probably wrong. But that's not to say that he didn't shout those words because who knows what people do in a moment of discovery 5,000 years ago, we didn't do everything online with photographs and videos and constant recordings. So we, we, we don't really know what he did at the moment of discovery, actually. Well, from my experience, Lee, uh, when I make a discovery, it's, there you are, you little bastard. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how my programming goes. <laughs> uh, Brother Shane, you had a question? Um, it was more of a comment. Um, <clears throat> I, I really enjoyed your um, how you described the uh, fellow craft degree as being one of the pursuit of knowledge. Um, I'm currently in college, and I was just raised to fellow craft two days ago. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I really like that the stage I am in my life that that's kind of where I am in masonry as well. That that's what I'm supposed to be going after. I just, I appreciated that, that you were, that you brought that up, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, it's something that I'm really pushing here in Poland and, and the Polish masons push quite hard. I think we often overlook the second degree. I, I think everybody likes to be initiated and everybody likes to be made a master because it's like the end, you know, you've got everything. Right. But but the second degree is really where the real work of life happens. To, to, we say that you are permitted to pursue the liberal arts and sciences. And I think we don't spend enough time in our lodges. If we're going to take good men and make them better, we also have to teach them practical skills. That that is the, that is the fellow craft part of being a mason. Learn some maths, learn some poetry, learn to play an instrument, learn a foreign language. You know, what are the seven liberal arts? You know, mathematics, grammar, rhetoric, music, astronomy. Actually master these things before you become a master. Pick one of them. I, I think we should challenge every brother as a fellow craft to choose. And, and you can interpret it as liberally as you like, but choose one of the several liberal arts and Study it, pursue it, get better at it, and that will be how you earn your master's degree. You know, <laughs> within masonry, I, I, I would be all for that. You know, I like that idea, Lee. This kind of your your talk during your talk when you mentioned about the fellow craft degree, and also when you talked about being able to recreate a square if you had to. Uh, there's a brother in my lodge, Sam Welty, who gives an excellent talk on the fellow craft degree and wearing of the apron and how in he, as he explains it which neatly dovetails with what you're saying is in masonry we mistakenly think okay we're all master masons because you know we quickly get a guy through the degrees and he's now a master mason we're all master masons we live as a master mason and he says we've got it completely wrong almost exactly what you're saying just put it a little different way but basically we we have an instant where we're an apprentice and we have an instant at the end where we're a master and 99.5% .5 of masonry, we're fellow crafts. All our lives, 
we're fellow crafts and we should be living in the fellow crafts degree. And we kind of have it off kilter because like you said, we don't think about the fellow craft degree literally except when we're getting ready to confer it. You know, Shane's here. He's an EA. He's getting ready to do the fellow craft. So we think about the fellow craft. We practice the fellow craft. We bring it in and we pass him to fellow craft. And then we forget all about it again until he stands his, well, he'll stand his fellow craft catechism when he's ready. And pretty much that's all we think about it. And we focus on the Master Mason's degree. And we really should be focusing on the fellow craft's degree in all of our thinking because we're living our lives as fellow crafts. Yes. Exactly. I think a much better exactly way to look that. at it. Yes. Um, how you doing, gentlemen? Uh, thank you for... Uh, Hello, Brother Michael. Thank you for allowing me to, to come on. Um, sir, I really thank you for the breakdown that you gave um, about the original um, in the English about the Pythagorean theorem being inside of the emblem of the past master, which I just learned probably about a month ago. Um, Cause we were comparing and, and I was doing a lecture on the past master degree for my district. And um, the way that you just eloquently described it, sir, uh, I really appreciate it. It's something that I'm gonna take back and do a little further research on. Um, but I do, um, I wanted to ask is I've read this recently um, with uh, the author, do, uh, Dr. Arturo de Hoyos, which is the, he's one of the hosts for the Masonic Temple here in America in DC. Um, the original, uh, in the beginning of our craft, wasn't the fellow craft degree there were only two degrees before it. is that correct well it, 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 it that that could be the topic of a whole other but <laughs> yes I, I i think i i think the short answer is yes it's generally accepted that to begin with there were only two degrees and the office of master and then somehow over time the office of master it was like you gave people honorary masterships and eventually that became a degree and uh, uh, but, but, okay. but no I more qualified people than me should should give you the full answer to that okay um second question i had this is something that i've asked uh, around uh, um uh, other lodges in uh different jurisdictions i don't know if i'm going a little outside but um we like it. Our, Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> okay. So, um, so in our jurisdiction, we are we are told, and I've looked this up in jurisprudence to see if there was any val validity into um, what I was being told. But you're not allowed to raise a a, a, a master mason without a past master present. And I'm wondering, is that due to the Pythagorean theorem or is it due to the quadrant? Well, here in the, um, the past masters here in America, the quadrant is worn as an emblem of the past master. Um, whereas in, like you said, the original had the Pythagorean theorem inside of it, 47 problem of Euclid. I was wondering if, what did you what do you guys practice there where you're at sir hey uh, michael i'm sorry can i ask that what what jurisdiction is where are you from just so we know i am from uh the prince or grand lodge of oklahoma, oklahoma? Um, okay yes um i am also a past master of the beehive uh beehive military lodge um 66 which is located in um korea oh excellent that, that that's fine i i just I will say, if I could speak on behalf of Virginia, and then I'll let Brother Lee answer, because American masonry does differ a bit from uh, our, our English brothers. We don't have an immediate past master office. Um, but okay. in Virginia, for example, you must have one of the three stationed officers present for any meeting. You must either have the master, the senior warden, or the junior warden present, or you cannot open a meeting. Anyone can open a meeting. We've had degrees where... 
I, we actually had an occasion where I had two events going on one night and someone said, well, the master will just go to this. We say, hold on, he can't because the junior warden and the senior warden are going to be over here. One of the three has to be here. We can't open the EA. So you have to have one of them in the room. They don't have to be in the east or even in an office. They just have to be in the room. One of the three station officers. Oh, you can't open. In Virginia, there's nothing anywhere that says you must have a past master present. I think by default, most every meeting, you're going to have at least one of us past masters in the room. But as far as we're concerned, there is no such requirement. Okay. Brother Lee, as I that. Yeah, yeah, like I, I, I don't think I've ever heard any regulations pertaining to past masters yet. I think it, it, it's a title that we, as I was saying, but, but maybe it's something we should let go of. It's something we're all very proud to be. And I often see, particularly amongst American Masons, that you put PM after your name. You know, um, we, we don't really do that in the UK. It's like you're, you're, you're a worshipful brother. So everybody knows that you're either a current master or a past master. You know, like, um, I think but I, I don't think there's like, any, uh, any, any like regulations. It's about the number of masters present. And and this is one of the great problems, like because we use master to mean so many things in Freemasonry, don't we? Right. And for our younger brethren, I don't want to disappoint you, but but the, the simple word master can can covers a whole host of sins, doesn't it, within Freemasonry? <laughs> like, I've, are I've you a master, me. the master, a grandmaster, a part, a primus master? Like, like, I, I was going to say, like, I have known people that would say, like, Doctor Brian Smith, comma. PhD. And I say, it's one or the other, man. Just pick one. But I don't know anybody who puts PM after the name. Maybe some do. I don't know anyone who does that. I mean, worshipful usually is enough to, yeah, I'm worshipful because I'm a past master. That's it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Brian. But, but yes, the, the answer ahead, to the question is I've oh. never seen it written in a regulation that a past master has to be present to perform okay. a ceremony. Another it's normally just um, masters in terms of the third degree. Right. And then, as you say, the, the actual officers of the lodge. And I think at some point I may have a uh, one of these meetings. We talk about the just about the past master's degree because it does vary so much. In America, we have the past master's degree as part of the Royal Arch chapter. And in Virginia in particular, you cannot be installed junior warden of a lodge unless you've received the past master's degree. So you must be a past master in order to be installed master and we require you to be junior warden so you have right well that's what makes it so complicated internationally yes. isn't it because <laughs> yes. past because in england when we talk about the past master and, and what this talk was about and when i this is what i mean about learning to let go right right you the past master the immediate past master is an office that you hold immediately on departing the church right. Right. And you kind of just float around in the lodge for a year with no particular job to do, just as the immediate past master to help the worshipful master that's just taken over finish off what's happening. Or the plans that you had, if any of them didn't come to full fruition. And, and, and right. uh, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense, does it? How can you be a past master before you've been a master? But it's because well, we use master to mean so many things. It's <laughs> called, it's actually called, I think it's virtual past master. The whole idea is you must receive formal training in how to be the master before you can be installed as the master. And at least in Virginia, at least the way that um, the way the Royal Arch has the past master's degree, it's to prepare you for the duties of the chair. And once you've had it, you are a virtual past master because you've received the degree and you've received the obligation and you're now a virtual past master and you're ready. It's kind of like on the job training or like, um, I don't know, kind of like uh, it's like giving you training before you actually get to sit as master. We want to make sure that you're yeah, ready yeah. to deal with it. I heard an interesting take on this once. The past master uh, maybe in American it's not so obvious, but when you have a nasty English northern accent like mine, past and past can be spelt in two different ways, right? P-A-S-T, meaning right. history, right. or P-A-S-S-E-D, as in right. having passed through. And right. there is some speculation that at some point in history, past masters 
lit to, in all, when the Royal Arch was coming into existence in order to qualify, because you couldn't take the Royal Arch unless you'd been the worshipful master of a lodge. Right. So you, so you would yeah. pass through the church and you would be the worshipful master just for one night <laughs> that, that then qualified you to oh. take the Royal Arch. And that made you a past with a D, <laughs> but you can't hear it. Wait. I can't say it properly. But right. Passed with a D, master. You were a past master. So you'd been through the chur, and that meant you could take the Royal Arch. That's, that's very interesting. Well, I yeah, no. Oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead. So, no, no go right ahead, Mike. Excuse my manners. Um, so there is a, uh, I actually gave a lecture about, um, about with that, uh, the same, uh, about the history of the past mass and then that did come up, especially with the Holy Royal Ark. Um, and if you understand what was going on between the ancient and the modern and what, what kind of started the, the issues between the two, um, but that's going outside of the blue crowd, that's more on the Scottish right side of this house. Um, but no. there were, <laughs> um, there were a, a, a number of issues and things that came up about the whole virtual past master degree. And there were allegedly brothers back then that were selling degrees. And yes. in order to, um, in order to pretty much hook your boy up or to get your membership up because it became a problem that there were brothers trying to, it became more of a numbers game instead of quality. And um, the virtual path master degree was given because um, pretty much the pass, the pass, the chair. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the higher degrees were given to those that were already um, past masters. So the higher degrees the were, chair. correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't want to go too too far again. I just wanted to just throw, just, uh, throw that in there. Um, and yeah, get... the, but brother Michael, that 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 echoes exactly what I was saying. It, it's true, you know. Like there was this there was this time when you would pass through the chair, even Correct. if you were only in the chair for an hour. But that meant you'd earn the right to be a past master because you now pass is it that. And, and, is that an actual degree then to make you a past master? No, not or? to begin with. No. no, it was it was just the fact that you literally in terms of English, it's just English language grammar, right? Right. You had passed through the church. You said okay, therefore you were a past. I'm sorry, master. Just to understand, <laughs> right. you, you said that you have to have been a past master to receive the Holy Royal Arch degree. But yes, passed with a D. They made exceptions. They somehow made an exception for someone who had not literally been master of a lodge so he could join the chapter. Yeah, yeah. So they just started doing it as a little thing. Like if if they wanted you in your in the Royal Arch Lodge and you'd not been the worshipful master of a lodge, they'd literally just put you in the chair for 30 seconds, let you bang the gavel once, get you out the other side, and then you would be a Past master, uh, like past uh, the D. You had the D. passed through the chair. Okay, now, if you, you take that, it. just take that idea. What we do in the Royal Arch is you have the Mark Master degree, which of course in England is its own separate body. There's yeah, yeah. So master, I, I, I am a Mark Master, and then there's the Past Masters degree, which is mm. literally it's a full degree where you you're on the sideline. I don't want to get too much into it and give it away for those I haven't got it yet, but. Basically, you get pulled off the sidelines, like, say, there's some argument in the lodge that you're sitting in, and someone nominates Brian, who's already a past master, and Lee, who's getting the degree, and Lee wins the election, and Lee is put, he has no idea what's going on, and he's now sitting in the East, and he's installed as the master, and he has to rule on this decision, this thing before the lodge, which is all put up, which is all part of the degree, but Lee, you have no idea, you're sitting there going, what the hell? So you're forced to make decisions mm -hmm. and it tests your knowledge of Masonic 
um, protocols. Now, I probably just gave away the whole thing, but that's basically... Well, what yeah, the is. mark's a bit different in England, then, but I can well, see no, no, how no, the same principle applies. It's I'm about saying, it's about to what extent you follow instructions, well, no, isn't no, it? The mark, is the, the mark degree fundamentally is about to what extent you should follow right. an instruction no, no, no. and to what extent you should do your own thing and how they get right. reconciled in the end. The mark degree is the first degree. Then the past master degree is the second degree. But we have to confer the past master's degree here in Virginia because it's a requirement to be installed as junior warden. We have people who don't want to join the chapter. So we have to offer what's called a provisional lodge of past masters where the, the Royal Arch a chapter will get together and confer the past master's degree on anyone who is getting ready to be junior warden. And they have to go through it, but they don't get the whole thing. And then there are past masters. And then you have a couple other degrees and then you have the Royal Arch. So you can't be a royal, my point is you can't be a Royal Arch Mason in Virginia unless you have received the past master's degree. It's one of the, uh, in Virginia, six degrees we confer. So that's why it's similar to what you guys do, but it's, you're like sort of literally 30 seconds in the chair. We actually have a whole degree wrapped around it. So it is quite different. And I've heard no. Oh no no is, no! It's not something we currently. I'm saying this is what happened in the past. This oh, is the, oh, it's not. This done is now. what was going on in the oh, late okay. 17, like, oh, late okay. 1700s, early 18th. I see. As the Royal Arch was coming into existence. But now today, could I, if I was not a past master T, could I join the Royal Arch? Yes, mm -hmm. any master mason, okay. Okay. as in the third degree, just the mm -hmm. simple third degree right. qualifies you then to go on into the Royal Arch. And another thing and in, getting, in the British system, in the English we're, system, we're getting a little uh, a feel, but <laughs> I know I want well, believe me, I get in trouble with Brian every time I say British instead of UK instead of Great Britain. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always getting called on the carpet. We're just the United States. If you say America, I know what you mean. I'm not going to call you out on it. But um, but we um, you have the Mark Master, to, ma the Mark Master, which is a body. And you have the Royal Arch, which is a body. And you mm -hmm. have the Cryptic Council, which is a body that you must belong to the Mark and the Royal Arch to join the Council or the Cryptic yes, Council. Yes, yes. In, in America, the... you have the Blue Lodge and then you have the Royal Arch chapter, which includes the Mark Master. Mark Master and then you have the Cryptic Degrees and then you have the Commandery. In Virginia... The two of the three council degrees are inside the chapter, and we don't have cryptic masonry. But we do it a different order than you do. You'd be a mark, and then a cryptic, and then royal arch. Whereas you do a different. Whereas I guess strictly speaking, um, the rest of America does it the way you do because you join the royal arch chapter, get the royal arch degree, and you've got the mark master degree, and then you join the cryptic masons. But I'd have to join two different bodies in England to get to the cryptic, and I'd only have to join one in America. And if I join the Royal Arch in Virginia, I get the cryptic sandwiched in between, so I'd get the Royal and Select Master before I get my Royal Arch degree. Which means I join, and this is when I went through the chairs or the uh, degrees. I'm a brother when I come into the Royal Arch, and I'm a brother, and I'm a brother, and then I'm a companion, and then I'm a companion again, and then I'm a brother again at the beginning of the Royal Arch degree, and I'm a companion at the end of it. And I was like, wait a minute, how come I got to be a companion in the last two degrees? Because we took the cryptic degrees and sandwiched them inside of the Royal Arch Chef. So we do things different in Virginia. <laughs> it is Brother Douglas, okay. it's, the same, it's the same for us, sir. Oh, yeah. Um, same for us. And um, a lot of times when I'm bringing brothers through, if you notice, and again, I'm not going to go outside anything for the for the, the guys here that haven't gone through that house yet um it's not in chronological order either oh um, that's so, a whole other thing yes no yeah no. masonry is not in chronological order at all <laughs> um, so so i have to um a lot of times the brothers are like you know when they go back and they read through the ritual and they're reading and they're like wait a minute I, I'm, I'm a companion and, I'm, and it's like you said and then i kind of helped them to, you know, the, the bridge, the gaps between the stories. And, uh, and, uh, this was funny to hear you saying that because we have to go through the Holy Royal Ark, then the cryptic, then the commandery. And that's how, we, and, yeah. uh, um, correct. I, I have this picture, yeah. sir. Yeah. yeah can so, can y'all see my screen? Yes. So I can see 
Here we yeah. go. We got Edit Apprentice, Fellow Craft, Mark Master, Select Master, First Half of the Royal Master, Master Mason, Second Half of the Royal Master, Most Excellent Master, Super Excellent Master, Royal Arch Mason, and then Order of the Red Cross, Temple, and Malta, which is Commander. So that's the chronological order in history if you're getting your Masonic degrees in order. <laughs> oh. All right. Now, it doesn't go in that order. because you oh, Not that. at all. Not at all. Yeah. And like the most excellent master you don't get in Virginia unless you um, have somebody from North Carolina come and confer it at our grand uh, chapter meetings. I went third to 18. Didn't What's do the that? Bill. I went third to 18. Yep. You know, yeah, third to the Rose Bar and didn't do the middle degrees. Well, I that, went, that... Back and did a mark, went back and did the mark degree. Okay. That's all I've done. Yeah. Anyhow. So, yes, uh, I, I would like to have, I think I may just schedule one of these unstated and just talk about, I don't know, there's there several things to come up, like the past master's degree and things like that that we kind of touch on during the discussions afterwards. And I'm, I'd kind of like to maybe arrange a, like a formal um, study for one of these meetings where we delve into that, have a couple of meetings from people give some details on it, because it's kind of one of the things that we kind of touch on briefly and i always want to come back and have another whole thing on it because it's really it it is interesting how it is so different in depending on what jurisdiction you happen to be in anyhow any more questions on brother lee you seem to be wandering all over the place today but that's quite all right and you were esoteric i don't care what anyone says esoteric <laughs> just means that there was there's the meaning and then there's a deeper meaning that's all esoteric is so you were esoteric you did touch on things that were you, even though you don't think you were, you were esoteric. So there. You if I fit your brief, then that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, you, en you mentioned a name of a book in your talk, which I can't remember the name of. Wh which one? Wh wh it was which part? A foreign language book. That's all I can remember about it. Um, there were two things that I meant. So, of course, we've got the elements, which was, and yeah. the other one was the the historian. I'm just, I'm gonna. Um, is a um uh diogenes diogenes wrote a book called the lives and opinions of eminent philosophers right. and what was the what was the book by euclid that you mentioned beginning the, the most widely read book was it's just called elements elements okay yes and, and it is like without question without doubt if you've not read it, then I mean, I'm sorry, but it, it, it's the most printed, most published, most bought, most read book in the whole of human history. And it just happens to be a mathematics textbook. textbook. No, I, I, I received a public school education. I, I never read the uh, elements. <laughs> so did Lee, but it means different. <laughs> Your son yeah, it means a different thing in the UK. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. <laughs> Here it's a bit of a disparaging thing. Like I only got a public school education. Well, I received more of an education in masonry than I ever did going to a, a brick and mortar. But, but when we talk about Euclid's elements, what we're really talking about is the geometry that you were taught at school. Yes. Like the, like the simple plain geometry where you accept that there are 180 degrees in a triangle and you, you and, and they say prove that. Yes. That, that was what Euclid brought. He gathered together all of these mathematical results and he stripped out all of the assumptions and boiled it down to just five things that you had to assume. Right. And then he built up the first fact from the first five assumptions. And now you've got six facts. And then using the yep. six, you can build a seventh. And this big tower of geometry was built. You only have to assume five things. Everything else can be proven. What the, well, what are the five um, things? Like, yeah, yeah. What are the five things? Um, a point is that which has no length, breadth, or depth. A line is that which is, exists when you extend a point. An area is that which exists when you... Um, and then the controversial one. Um, lines are parallel if they never meet. Okay. Off, off. No, we, we could go on a huge tangent about that because, of course, in modern physics, that's not true anymore. And we have different geometries now. Euclid's geometry is not the only geometry. 
and right. and that could have been a tan but that's more of a tangent for a mathematical audience than a masonic one because that it starts to get very technical very quickly right but to give you an example when you look at a map of the earth on the wall you have lot parallel lines on it and those parallel lines run north to south but if two people walked along those lines eventually they would meet at the north pole right because there comes a point when there's no more north left to go <laughs> and that's because the earth is inherently round so because the space itself is inherently curved parallel lines do meet at the infinite point right Right. But, but I guess the assumption is it, it, you're talking about a plane. If you have two lines, two parallel yes. lines on a plane, they never meet. The Earth is right on a plane. plane yes, sphere. exactly. So. And that's what we call Euclidean geometry. Right. But there is also Riemannian geometry and Einsteinian geometry, and and, and right. there are different geometry. And and it turns out that Euclidean geometry is probably not the true one. <laughs> <laughs> because because if 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 you shut if you stand if you if you take three mountains far enough apart and you shine lasers from the top of one mountain to another and the top of one and then you measure the angles they don't add up to 180 degrees because space itself is fundamentally curved because of gravity and all of that general right. relativity stuff well but you have to think about the the practical application of euclidean geometry we couldn't build anything if we didn't use Euclidean geometry. And that assumes exactly. that everything yes. is a flat surface. So if I'm building, if I'm erecting a building, I'm not taking into account the shape of the earth. I'm just simply building a block. I'm building a cube or a, well, it's three dimensional. Uh, what's a three dimensional cube that's a rectangle? What is that called? It's not a cube. It's a, <laughs> what is it called? <laughs> a breeze block. A what? Oh, yeah, brick. A brick. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I'm sorry. No, no. I'm trying to use the right a, term. A cuboid. We call them cuboids. A cuboid. Okay, because a, a square is also a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. So if I build a yeah. cube, it's it's the same height as the width. I'm saying if I build a building, that's basically a cuboid. I'm not taking into account that the Earth curves and it's going to be flat for that section of Earth in which I'm sitting. And I guess the foundation takes. I don't think you could even measure the curve of the Earth for a building that's 100 feet across. But you assume that it's flat, so right. everything and, is and, nice and flat when you're building stuff. All those and, other and, and, and I think, and I think that that gets to the point of what I was trying to say. Because as a leader, of course, you generally do things the way they've been done, because that's the way they've been done, and that's the way that it works. But you must be very sensitive to the fact that you are very often using approximations. And when a new situation arises that proves difficult for people, it's often because the approximation that you've been using is no longer applicable. You've gone outside the bounds where the approximation is applicable and you need to actually focus on the truth, yeah. not, not the convenient approximation that makes it easy for everybody. Very good. Very interesting. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, I think this has been an actually a very a quite esoteric uh, discussion, despite these protestations. So, fine work, sir. You're entitled to your wages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you'll PayPal me them, right? Will you? I, I didn't know I was being paid for this. You're, you are paid. You're, I, I, I pay you the same. I will pay you exactly half what Brian and I make. <laughs> so there. <laughs> Well, Mason, we are we are paid in different wages, and I, I, I'm paid by the privilege of bringing together brilliant minds and sharing ideas about masonry. And I, I don't know. I step back every once in a while, and I look at the thirty odd um, uh, Zoom meetings I've had here since starting in 2020, and it's like, holy crap! I managed to do all this and pull this off, and get all these people together and have these Zoom meetings, and and they're there on YouTube. Any one of you can go. The links in the chat there. Any any of you can go and. Um, go look at all the YouTube videos we made. We've had some really, really neat talks here. Stuff I haven't even heard in the blue, like alchemy. I never hear anybody talk about alchemy in the blue lodge, even in the research lodges. But we've had at least two discussions on alchemy. And some some of us would argue that masonry is, is since we're delving into the hidden science that is 
that masonry exists to perpetuate knowledge that would otherwise be lost. And by passing it along within the Blue Lodge, we are ensuring that that knowledge does not get lost to barbarism. So the world outside may fall apart, but Masons continue to teach. Nowadays in the modern world, exactly. any one of you, any one of you it, can go out and get a book and study online and find all this knowledge. It's not hidden anymore, but my, we have uh, it uh, perpetuated. I really like what, that little sentence that you just said. If all the knowledge is, if, if it's all lost, we can go back and rebuild it. Exactly. That is the point of the immediate past master and the 47th proposition of Euclid. If we lost all the squares, we could rebuild them because in our minds, we know what a right angle is and how to prove that one is one. Like Perfect. that's thank you, Lee. <laughs> yes. And but the... The, the point being that we in masonry, the, the reason masonry exists and a lot of us, I think we're kind of searching for it because we know it's almost like, We've almost got it right, but there's something missing. And that's something I, I try. That's one of the underlying themes in these unstated meetings and why I push Masonic education is the vast majority of masonry being practiced isn't really masonry. It's social interaction and it's enjoyable and we have brotherhood and that is all well and good and that is all critically important. We can't have masonry if we're not all coming together as brothers. And the basic lessons are being taught and we're doing that. We're, we bring, we come together on the level. We're all equals. We're all Masons together. And we all have mutual love and respect for each other. But the underlying current is Masonry exists to have this conduit of knowledge to survive the Dark Ages and keep the knowledge going along. And too often, we're not teaching that because we kind of stop teaching that from one generation to the next. I don't go to Lodge and learn about alchemy. I don't learn about Euclidean geometry and all of this other than what's strictly written down in the lectures. And we teach exactly the lecture and no more. And you can memorize the lecture and have no idea what it means. And the whole point of esotericism is I can memorize the fellow crafts senior deacon lecture and give it and talk about the three, five and seven steps and all of that. I can memorize every word and not understand it or how it applies to our daily lives. But as long as I memorize it and I do the senior deacons and lecture for Brother Shane and he hears me say it and he's like, OK, we check a box. He got the lecture. And that's kind of where I think masonry is right now is we're checking the boxes. We're not teaching actual education. We're not digging in the esotericism. And some of us want that and some of us are pushing that. And I like to think that's part of where we're going with this group and other groups that are out there. It's like, we're trying to bring something back out that has kind of been lost. The the basic, the, the underlying truths of masonry that aren't being taught anymore. And we need to bring those back out and start teaching them again. So again, I keep wrapping my head around it. If you go back and watch all of these videos, you hear me ramble about this from time to time. I haven't fully articulated it yet. One day I'll get it all written down and I'll tell you all exactly what I'm trying to say. But I feel like I'm grasping at it and we touch on it when we meet and I kind of see another little piece of the puzzle and I don't quite have it all together yet. So it's a little frustrating to me, if that makes sense. But you may just think I'm just rambling. I should shut up. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> uh, anybody else have anything to share before we wrap it up? Anyone, anyone know? Okay. Um, next meeting is on December 3rd. Um, here in Virginia, we are, we have our annual meetings in December. So all of our, and all of our lodges meet and install new officers. And I'll be busy going to some of those and being the installing officer in a couple of places, including my lodge. Um, but on December 3rd, we will still have our meeting and we're going to have brother Chad Kopensky who was one of our previous attendees. He will presenting Shearer, I don't know how to pronounce it, S-H-E-R-E-R, Shearer's Masonic Carpets, The Importance of Fascination, How a Passing Glance Under the Secretary's Desk Led to a Still Unfolding Mystery, Deeper Connections, and Greater Appreciation of Freemason. So that should be most interesting. That'll be on December 3rd. That's in two weeks after we Americans have our Thanksgiving and you Brits continue to eat bangers and mash or whatever it is you do when we're on Thanksgiving. Um, 
And then uh, on the 17th, uh, Brother Rodney Mickelvery, who has been here before, will speak on a Kabbalistic interpretation of Freemasonry. So we yet again start delving into the Kabbalah. So that's one of those truly esoteric things. That's on the 17th. And then we're getting into next year. So I do have speakers lined up for the foreseeable future every two weeks. Uh, if you are in Virginia or you can be in Virginia on December 10th, in between those, that is going to be our annual for Virginia Research Lodge. And I will, I expect to go in as senior warden for Virginia Research Lodge. That's in Highland Springs. If you can physically attend, we'd love to have you there. Uh, anyone who's watching this on YouTube, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, Matt Sermoski, who is now the grand junior warden of Virginia, who is a fellow um, senior DMLA. He was past state master counselor, and he's going to be grandmaster of Virginia. And we don't have a lot of uh, DMLAs who go from being state office and then lodge state office as well, which is really cool. But Matt's going to be speaking on the silver bullet and masonry at our annual state. So that should be fun. So lots coming up. Um, good to see you all. Thank you all very much for attending, especially my regular attendees who are here every week, every two weeks. And those of you who are new, please come back and visit us again. Brother Michael, we should talk about uh, maybe having you come and give a talk sometime. I'm always looking for new speakers. So uh, message me your oh, contact info. Uh, definitely, sir. I was going to ask you because I'll be, I'll be giving a lecture on the, on the end of the apprentice um, degree, uh, esoteric. Okay. So I do teaching on esoteric because that's actually my favorite. <laughs> you see, you you be speaking on that where online um, so or going to be it's going to be on the Zoom. Okay. Um, are you it, are you a member of our Facebook group? I'm not. Uh, okay. Did you get Brian, it in the chat? Yes, he sent me the link. Oh, hey, very good, very good. Uh, yes, please sir. reach out to me through the group, and uh, we'd like to. You can promote your event. We're happy to promote other people's Zoom events. Uh, okay, so get some attendance and we can talk about maybe you come and host in one of these or speaking in one of these in the future. Okay, I'm so always looking for speakers. Uh, Brother Shane, I hope it didn't blow your mind too much. I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> it was a great, it was great. I enjoyed it. Well, you are welcome to come back anytime. And I don't think, uh, uh, Brother Coke, I don't think we gave away anything from the Master Masons degree that would have spoiled <laughs> it for him here. That was the concern. <laughs> Uh, we're open. I should say this for anybody. We are open to non-Masons. We're open to candidates. If someone wants to be a Mason, in the case, Shay, Shay's case, Shane's case, where he's an EA or a fellow craft or whatever, and he's coming through, you don't have to be a Master Mason to attend these. You may not understand everything if you're not a Master Mason, but we want, I'm not super strict. I'm not worried about jurisdictions. There's no way I can possibly validate you all. So, you know, I'm assuming that you're a good man and you're not in a clandestine lodge I mean, even if you are maybe i'll convince you to leave it and go be in a regular lodge but uh we don't we don't bother with jurisdictional <laughs> stuff here you're interested in learning about masonry we're open and lee's there you go to... oh there, there you we are. are what's that <laughs> it's my united grand lodge of england master mason certificate and oh, yes, the we need warrant that. of enigma lodge totally well, verified it, it's go. a little late he's our speaker <laughs> and we're just now finding out that he's he's clandestine oh well <laughs> Too late. <laughs> I, I do think I think at some point I will have um, some brothers come in here and talk about clandestine masonry. That could be an interesting discussion. But remember, that means a very different thing in some parts of the world. It is. We I have clandestine it. masonry in Poland, but when you talk about clandestine masonry, it means the regular masonry that existed whilst the communists and the Nazis were in charge. Interesting. Quite Interesting. A different thing. When you Quite talk a about clandestine lodges in Poland, you're talking right. about the the Masons that were actively breaking the law because right. it was illegal under communism and, and, and Nazism. Understood, yes. Um, so they were clandestine. To the but that doesn't mean they weren't regular. And, and, and actually, the lodges we have evolved from clandestine lodges. So. Okay. Wow. All right, well... I want to say uh, please like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube. And those of you who are here, please come back and visit us again. Anybody else have anything to say before we wrap up? All right. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you again, Brother Lee. I hope you'll come back and join us for some of our other talks and check out our, our YouTube uh, videos. There's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Okay. You all have a wonderful um, 
day, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Good night, brethren. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.